Welcome to another video for STAT 420. In this video, we're going to talk about um, explanation versus prediction perspectives in um, kind of going about modeling. So um, kind of these two different approaches highlight two different purposes that we might model. Um, the first um, being explaining where our interest is more in kind of identifying how variables relate in the form of a model. Um, just caring a little bit more about kind of the why and how um, these relationships kind of um, depend on one another. Um, whereas prediction is more concerned with just making accurate predictions of a response from information at hand. It's not necessarily as concerned um, with why the variables relate the way they do or exactly what that relationship is as much as we want to use um, the predictive power that it offers us. Um, so a little bit more about explanation. Um, explanation is usually going to be more concerned with the context. Um, it's going to be more concerned with the coefficients in our model. So for example, when we interpret coefficients in a regression model and we're talking about this is representing kind of the, the average um, or expected change in the response given a one unit increase in the predictor variable, um, that kind of goes along with this explanation of, you know, this is how much change we are seeing. Um, so for that reason, it's usually more concerned with uh, making so, uh, simpler models. Um, we want the fewest predictors that we really need. We tend to like having linear relationships because those are easier to interpret. They say something more about kind of how the variables relate to one another. Um, and we're using them um, kind of in context to make sense of something. Um, so it's kind of you know building theory, building understanding of a process. So on this discussion, as we think about kind of building theory about how things relate, it gets into this conversation of correlation versus causation. Um, and so you have likely seen this before if you're taking this course. Um, however, we'll just kind of get on the same page here. So correlation is just noticing that two variables relate to one another. That if we know something about one, um, we might be able to say something about the other. We might be able to make predictions about the other. But to go that extra step of, of causation, that's kind of like a little bit more specific. It's actually recognizing one variable directly causing changes in the other. And that is going to be um, something that we would have to um, discern if we have done an experiment or if we have the appropriate theory to kind of back up um, the data that we're seeing. So an experiment would be if I am kind of setting up an intervention. If I am creating an environment such that I am comparing what happens in different scenarios, and the only thing that I'm changing is um, kind of the, the predictor variable, um, the, or sometimes I call it a treatment factor, that if I kind of change this setting or I kind of change this, this starting value, do I see a difference in the response? Does, does the response, is, is there a kind of a, a difference response from that? Um, and if I've controlled all other things, if I'm confident that this predictor variable, this treatment factor is the only thing changing, then any change I see in the response should be as a result of that. So that would be an experiment. However, a lot of the data that we're working with is collected more in an observational study format. Where we're just kind of collecting data that exists, but not necessarily in some kind of controlled intervention. Like we're just, we just have survey data, we just have kind of gathered information, but not as a result of this carefully controlled intervention. So when we're doing that, we can't actually be confident that one variable is directly causing changes in the other, only that we're observing that they correlate, that we're observing that they seem to go together. Um, so, so I think there's an example in the book about um, shoe size and um, maybe it was intelligence. I honestly can't remember what the response variable was, um, but, but something about kind of shoe size and, you know, you know, schooling ability that, that the larger somebody's shoe size, like for, we're in a school, um, shoe size is probably a reasonably good predictor of, of reading level or intellectual ability because it's really just kind of a, a measure of, of, of size of age, right? That, that if you're older, you probably have a larger shoe size, and as a result, you probably also have better um, scores on that um, measure. But it doesn't mean that your shoe size is what's actually contributing to your, your intellect um, or your reading abilities. So you shouldn't be putting large shoes on somebody to increase their reading ability. It's only kind of a, a correlation. It's kind of a signal of, of that 
um, something else being true of that other actual causal agent being present. So it's the same thing here again, uh, that we wanna be really careful when we're observing that variables go together, that we're not jumping to conclusions about causation without um, a better design or without appropriate theory to go with that. So prediction's a little bit different. Prediction doesn't really care so much about which one's the causal agents and what are simply associative factors. The end game here is that we just wanna be able to predict a response variable with a lot of reliability. And if I have some information, how does that information get used to kind of model this response variable? So predictions are much more practical. Um, it serves this practical purpose. Um, we don't necessarily need to understand why the variables behave the way they do. It's nice to, um, but it's not a requirement of this. Now, if I'm trying to do something that's more kind of extrapolation, like if I'm trying to predict something outside of a range of data that I've observed before, um, you know, maybe explanation matters more because if I'm extrapolating, then I wanna know how this, these variables relate together and if I should expect that relationship to change outside my observed range. So, so maybe that would be a context where explanation enters the picture. Um, but outside of that, if I'm just looking at, if I'm just kind of churning data in and I have this model that works really well within this particular range, then as I gather new data, I can probably make some reasonably good predictions. So to compare um, predictive power, we, on, um, we often um, might use this measure, um, RMSE, um, which stands for the root mean square error. Um, and so you might recognize that this formula looks really familiar um, because it looks a lot like the standard um, error of the residual, so so um, we, uh, abbreviated S sub E, and that's going to be the square root of the sum of the squared residuals divided by um, N minus two. And so S sub E is an unbiased estimate of sigma sub E, the, the true standard deviation of the residuals, um, kind of this true parameter that exists that if I had all the data that exists, then I can calculate how much residual error um, um, this model has, um, like kind of this, basically this average residual um, for a model um, over all the data. However, I calculate it for my sample with S sub E, um, and I hope that S sub E is a reasonably good prediction of sigma sub E. Now this difference here is this N minus two, right? So. So we, we divide S sub E by N minus two because that's what makes it an unbiased estimator of sigma sub E. So whenever I have parameter estimates involved in a sample statistic, um, I'm going to have some extra error that gets associated with that sample statistic that makes it a biased estimator. And so this is about making an unbiased estimator. Now, if I'm just trying to evaluate how well my model is fitting, I don't really care about the error correction. Um, so it doesn't really matter if I'm dividing by n minus two or n. The bottom line is I care about kind of this, this overall residual error. And so for that reason, um, we just divide by n and um, we kind of use this as kind of an average residual without worrying about whether it's a biased or unbiased statistic. So um, one other thing is that the RMSE is always going to favor the larger model if we're looking at the same data. So if you think about I have some set of data, I have some different model options, I can fit a model with one predictor, I can fit a model with several predictors. Well, for every time I add a predictor, my model is going to be fitting a little bit more. Um, my RMSE is always going to be going down as I add another predictor. And that's because if I add more information, I can't be worse at predicting the response from the information I have. I can only get better at that. Um, with the same set of data. So that's why the RMSE is probably not a great measure for comparing um, forms, right? So, so form would be kind of this, this model fitting part of, you know, which predictor should I use? What form should they take? So RMSE is not gonna be a really a, a great method in um, choosing the right form um, if I'm just using it on the same data and trying different options, because it's always just gonna favor the, the biggest model. So that's why um, we might use what's called um, test data that we're gonna talk about. So let me get myself out of the way here. Um, so this measure is gonna be most helpful when used to test the fit of the data 
um, on data that was not used in the model fitting process. So we basically take some other data that we didn't use and trying to fit the model and trying to fit our beta hats. And then we basically test it out to see how well it fits and how low our RMSE value is on this new set of data. Um, and so the reason why we don't just want to go with the largest model is this issue of overfitting. Um, so, so you might be wondering, it's like, well, why don't I just use all the variables? Why don't I throw, throw all the variables into the model if it's going to make it a better fitting model? And the answer is because overfitting um, can be a problem, where if I have some data, I can keep tinkering with my model to get the least amount of residual possible for the data that I happen to have. But at some point, I'm going to stop modeling the signal and I'm going to start modeling the noise. So here's an example of um, what is probably just a linear relationship between these two variables. But if I get too hung up on trying to model this noise, I'm going to overfit this relationship. I'm going to fit something that's way too complicated, that's trying to get um, way too close to these individual data points. And then when I get a new set of data, my overfitting model looks kind of ridiculous at this point because it's fitting data that's no longer here. Um, and instead, it's the linear model that actually makes more sense because the linear model is kind of going after the signal. The overfitted model was going too much after the noise that once I have a new set of data, it's, it doesn't make any sense anymore. So this is why I don't want to just keep adding predictors and trying to keep adding complexity to my model because at some point, I stop modeling the signal and I'm starting to model the noise and then my model isn't very useful anymore. Um, so this is where kind of this test train split idea comes in is if I have a set of data and I want to decide what my best, um, um, what the best form for this model might be, maybe what I could do is set some of my data aside and call it my test data and then fit a model with my training data. And then I can um, take those parameters and I can plug in my, my test data and make predictions and see how close my model gets at predicting those values. And so that's where kind of this RMSE value can be a little bit more helpful, is if I have several kind of options, I can fit two or three or four or however many models that I want with different forms, um, and then run my test data through those different options and calculate the RMSEs to see which one ends up being the lowest. So then I get away from just picking the model with the most variables, but picking the model that seems to, to make a reliable fit um, even in the context of fewer variables. So it, it really kind of tests out which models are really going after the signal versus models that are overfitting and are just starting to model noise after some point with the data that I happen to have. Now, um, a common benchmark would be like 80-20, where you put like 80% of your data in training, 20% for testing. It doesn't have to be 80-20. Um, typically, the more data you have in your training data, the better at creating a better model. Um, however, you just need to make sure that you have enough data for testing. So you don't want too few uh, data in your test data, or else you're not going to be able to get an accurate RMSE value. Um, so making a training and test data, uh, tr test subset. Um, so, so one of several ways that we could do this is to use the sample function where you sample from your data, and then um, you sample without replacement, and you make that your training data, the rest of it can be your test data. So here's kind of a sample code, but I did it in the context of a vector just to make it a little bit more um, interesting for you, working with a data frame of thinking about what modifications you might have to use here. Um, but let's say I have a, a vector um, called x. x is just a vector of values from 1 to 10 and I want to randomly choose five entries from X to be my training. The other five are going to go into my test um, subset. So then um, I'm going to sample from um, this many data points. So I'm going to sample one to the length of X, um, and then I'm going to, I'm sorry, I guess I should clarify. Um, this, this method right here is sampling indices. It's sampling kind of which rows I'm going to take. So that's why I'm going one to the length of x is because I'm going to sample kind of random row numbers if you want to think of it that way. This is how many I'm going to sample 
and um, I'm going to sample without replacement. I'm not going to replace and sample the same row multiple times because that doesn't make any sense. Um, and then I'm going to subset out those rows of X to be my training, and I'm going to subset out not these rows to be test. Um, so again, this is with a vector. So if you're doing this with a data frame, you're going to have to make some adjustments. So, so length of X wouldn't work if it's a data frame. You need like in row. Um, and this subsetting was going to look a little bit different if it's a data frame, um, but it's kind of the same um, logic going on here. So a summary of, of what we talked about here. So we talked about um, explanation and prediction as two kind of approaches to modeling, two different motivations. So when using a model to explain relationships, we prefer kind of these small interpretable, interpretable models. We're trying to understand how these variables relate and quantify what that relationship is. When using models to predict observations, we prefer models that make the smallest errors possible without overfitting. We're trying to get a result, we're trying to predict accuracy, um, and we'd like to use as much information as we can, but not at the expense of overfitting, as long as we are only modeling um, there's the signal that we have and that we don't start overfitting and modeling um, the noise.